for an academy, the great global lockdown. Uh, we all have been living through a lockdown in India, so we know what this is all about, and it's happening globally as well. The real question is, what is the impact of the lockdown? What is the economic impact in particular? We can imagine the psychological impact on people, the social impact, but the economic impact is a key issue. And there is very little doubt that there is going to be a very significant impact. In fact, um, as uh, we all realize, countries are going to emerge from this whole coronavirus crisis with their economies ravaged, uncertainty scaring off investors, unemployment rising and perhaps even uh, rising to record levels in many countries, and public debt skyrocketing. With a further reduction in global demand, there's no question that we'll have slower global growth. UNCTAD, the UN Conference on Trade and Development, has warned that it'll be under 2% this year. ...of the world economy, but many others think that's too optimistic. Many are saying, oh, well below 1%. Some are saying even zero, or some, the doomsayers, are talking about negative growth, which would mean a recession worldwide. In fact, the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, predicts that the economic downturn is expected to actually be one of the worst recessions since the Great Depression of the 1930s. Now, one of the obvious consequences of this for human beings is unemployment. There is going to be a very, very significant impact on the job front. The informal sector, particularly large and developing countries like ours, will be the hardest hit because the informal sector doesn't have the protections of organized labor. The informal sector often depends on daily cash wages as the work comes in, the salaries are paid, and therefore, in very many cases, poor countries and poor communities and poorer individuals are the biggest victims of this situation. And for this reason, um, Oxfam has asked world leaders to agree upon a $2.5 trillion global economic rescue plan. I am not counting uh, the moments for that to come through because, of course, the rich countries who could finance something like this are themselves facing a very severe economic downturn in the wake of COVID-19. Poverty, hunger, homelessness already evident um, from the lockdown in our country and from in many other countries. Um, what would be the longer term economic impact? One of the obvious concerns everyone has is that money will stop, stop coming in to develop. There will be a lot of uncertainty for several months, maybe a year or so, after the virus is over. Global investor sentiment is going to be affected because, of course, no one knows what kind of policies countries are going to make when it comes to domestic markets or to exports and imports, and no one knows what the global system is going to agree upon. There is a general desire to independence especially after people saw what happened when China shut down in January, there was an immediate disruption to supply chains to other parts of the world, and many vital commodities could not be manufactured because the raw materials or key parts came from countries like China, which were then affected by COVID-19. So many are saying, hey, we need to be more self-sufficient, and that's going to have a negative impact on FDI flows. Travel and tourism are already, already very, very severely affected, with so many airlines shutting down, so many flights closing to so many countries. Essentially, um, the restrictions that governments have had to introduce to prevent the virus traveling has obviously also prevented human beings traveling, and the result is that the travel industry and the tourism industry in many countries are in particularly bad shape. Um, businesses are, of course, coping with revenue losses across the board. Factories are shutting down across the world. Supply chains, as a result, are simply not being able to function. And commerce overall, within countries and internationally, have been disrupted. In India, we're seeing a domestic impact because of the restrictions on interstate commerce.
and the same thing, of course, multiplied when it comes to international comments. Uh, the adverse impact on agriculture and food security, very troubling. Uh, right now, the government has rightly made an exception in India to the lockdown for agricultural workers to get to the fields. Because if the rabi crop is not harvested, we are going to end up with the food, the grains rotting in the fields. But the fact is, in some cases, there has been wastage when harvested crops, fruits, vegetables, and even dairy products like milk could not be transported to the mandis and the markets, uh, which were not functioning normally anyway, and in many cases had to be wasted or thrown away. On top of that, uh, the consequences for food security from the disruption of agricultural supplies and food supplies cannot be underestimated. There are two other points on the economic impact which we'll come to, a slump in oil prices. I'll deal with that in more detail in a few minutes. And the deglobalization of the world economy, which deserve attention by themselves. But it's important to stress as we talk about the economy that above all, the economy only matters because we're talking about people. A healthy economy is not possible without healthy people. And keeping people healthy is what the present priority ought to be and is for most countries in the world. What kind of economic crisis management are we seeing around the world right now? Well, there's obviously the traditional monetary and fiscal measures that governments can take. Governments around the world are doing these things, stimulus measures, and often very big stimuli. Um, uh, these include cutting interest rates, uh, quantitative easing, the US is famous for that, putting out major economic packages, bailouts for companies that are losing money and can't be viable without it, unemployment insurance. The US has pledged $2 trillion in economic stimulus, and it said that that is not going to be enough and they're going to have to increase that too. There are other economic measures beyond these sort of classic monetary and fiscal measures, but they're measures like direct cash transfers. That's something the Indian government uh, is doing, but has been urged to do more of, including by the opposition. That is, get some more money into the Jandhan accounts, double the amount of money going to farmers in the PM Kisan Yojana, try and get some money paid to the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme workers. Direct cash to people is often the best way of being able to ensure that they're buffered against the economic shock of, of COVID-19. Wage subsidies will be required because very often employers can't afford to pay wages, and that becomes a real issue. Relaxation and interest payments. Where the governments are in a position to decree that, or to at least cover the bank's losses when they relax interest payments, then you're in good shape because people are able to bear the sudden onset a few months from now, having to pay all their accumulated arrears. Temporary tax relief to businesses, of course, is a classic approach as well. The Indian government has offered, and some of the state governments have offered, to pay provident fund benefits and pension benefits in advance. And that, too, could be a very constructive measure in this time. But all of these things cost money. And at the moment, um, the crisis management measures around the world are uneven, and some would even see fairly spotty. Now, there are crisis management issues beyond immediate economics. One is, of course, the huge tension in the entire domain of international cooperation between the groups led notably by President Donald Trump of the US, who blamed the WHO, saying they've mismanaged the crisis and cost lives, and others led by many uh, Western countries as well as Asian and African countries and China, who say, no, it's more important to come together to cooperate and fight the virus. The US, meanwhile, amidst all of this, has suspended its funding for 60 to 90 days, pending a detailed review by the US government of how WHO has been functioning. Um, no one is holding their breath for that money to come back very quickly because in terms of US politics, it's very clear that President Trump is looking for a scapegoat for his own initial mishandling of the crisis when he didn't take it seriously enough. And he is now saying essentially he was misled by WHO 
which she was guilty, he says, of actually peddling the Chinese line too long. On the other hand, some other Western countries, which also didn't do too well in the early stages of the crisis, have rallied around WHO. Britain has said they are increasing their funding to WHO for the crisis. China has hinted that it will do the same. So international cooperation is itself a victim of the coronavirus. But broadly speaking, within countries, I think it's very clear that one of the immediate budgetary consequences of the coronavirus is that countries feel obliged to try and ensure the availability of the resources to tackle the virus, enhance testing facilities. I remember when the virus, the first cases came to India, they were to my state of Kerala, the samples had to be sent off to the National Virology Institute in Pune, which was the only place capable of actually doing the testing as to what the coronavirus uh, was and, and whether this was the coronavirus. Today, uh, many, many more labs, I think the official figure is 112, I don't know, they're all equally well equipped, are authorized to test for the coronavirus. Intensive care units are being strengthened, readied, and added to. Vaccine development is proceeding on an urgent basis. It's widely assumed the U.S. will take the lead, but other countries, Israel uh, and, and, and a few other nations, are reported to have made good progress in identifying a vaccine. And, of course, the availability of drugs and pharmaceuticals is key, particularly when some of the raw materials for these drugs comes from elsewhere. For example, America's entire supply of ibuprofen, the pain and inflammation reliever, the entire raw material to make ibuprofen came from China. So that was disrupted. Hydrochloroxyquinine, which India is um, a world leader in, again, is not made in many Western countries. And India was asked by the Americans to get it to them. So availability of drugs and pharmaceuticals is a very important issue. Now, let's step back for a second and ask ourselves about pandemics. Um, are pandemics the new normal? Well, first of all, I think it's extremely important to realize that pandemics are not a new phenomenon. They have been affecting the world since times immemorial. And on this, it's very important to realize there have been several lethal pandemics of flu. One million people died in the Russian flu, so-called, of 1889-90. There was an Asian flu in 1956 to 58, which killed 2 million people. And the so-called Hong Kong flu in 1968 accounted for 1 million fatalities. There have been alerts about, in more recent years, about bird flu, avian flu, swine flu. There was a 2003 severe acute respiratory syndrome, SARS, that also came from China, other threats of pandemics. But nothing can match the bubonic plague of 1346 to 1353, the so-called Black Death, which lasted seven years and killed, I'm sorry the slide has it wrong, it wasn't corrected on time, it killed an incredible 75 to 200 million people out of a world population which is perhaps three times that size. Can you imagine one third of the entire human race was wiped out in the Black Death? Um, there'd been an incident already earlier uh, the Antonin Plague, in which, in fact, 25 million people died, half the population of Europe, a few centuries, a thousand years before the Black Death. So major plagues had been known. Uh, it probably traveled around the world from China on rat-infested merchant ships, and it killed so many people. And then in the 20th century, I've given you examples that killed two and three and one and so on, million people, but the Spanish flu of 1918 to 19 killed more people around the world than both world wars combined. Again, despite the unfortunate name of the Spanish flu, which gives Spain a bad reputation, it again almost certainly in China. Now, pandemics, of course, may not be a new phenomenon, but they have become more frequent in our time because of increased global travel and integration, population growth, environmental damage, the increasing emergence of viral disease from animals, whether because of the eating habits of some humans, particularly in China, or as a result of environmental deformations, has seen a great increase in what's called zoonotic diseases, in which pathogens cross the boundary between animal-to-animal -animal transmission 
and affect human beings by transforming into diseases that are transmitted human to human. Now, there's so many, many gaps and shortfalls, and this is something that um, we have to understand um, because the truth is that um, we don't have pandemics licked, as the very list I've given you so far suggests. There's challenges relating to the timely detection of disease, the availability of basic care, tracing of the spread of infection, the quarantine and isolation procedures adopted by various countries, which vary from country to country, and when they kick into effect, the major challenges of global coordination and response, which we're seeing on COVID, as well as the mobilization of resources to fight pandemics, particularly in relatively poor countries. There, India is not too badly off, but imagine this hitting a country in sub-Saharan Africa or in some of the poorer states in, in, in Asia and Latin America, the calamity is difficult to imagine. The truth is, the worst pandemic threats are the ones like COVID. Those that transmit easily and rapidly between humans have long asymptomatic infectious periods, by which I mean infected persons can infect others while their own infections are still undetected. That's an asymptomatic infectious period. And of course, an illness that is easily confused with a lesser threat. Uh, for example, COVID initially is confused or a cold or a flu, and then, of course, it turns out to be much more serious and kills people. Um, and, of course, developing countries are always the most at risk because of their high levels of malnutrition, insufficient access to good medical care, higher rates of disease transmission, as well as a much lower medical infrastructure capacity. They have less access to modern medical techniques, and most developing countries have a greater density of population as well. So in these circumstances, I think that um, the impact of COVID and the response that COVID is, is going to uh, get from the world is going to be very significant, and a lot will depend on how soon the vaccine can be developed. Um, there's going to be a lockdown in our country at least on the 3rd of May. There will be some staggered lifting from the 20th of April, very selective, specific industries and limited number of districts and i think you're going to see that some of the measures taken during the lockdown some of the practices may have to be prolonged until a vaccine is created we may never be able until a vaccine is created to get together again in mass rallies with election rallies or movie theaters or whatever we may have to really inculcate the habits of basic sanitation hand washing. It's tough in India where running water is, is, is so much of a luxury to so many people, where soap is not available in many places even where water is. But basic sanitary practices like that and a certain degree of social distancing is going to be around for months to come. I think the namaste is certainly going to be around, um, get a new lease of life in our culture uh, where we're all already practicing it a lot, but we're going to have to practice it much more intensively now as, as uh, COVID threatens us all. Um, restrictions on touching, restrictions on travel. For example, you know that when flights are going to resume in India, airlines will be obliged to keep one seat free between passengers, one seat or an aisle free between passengers. It means in the longer term, prices may go up because let's say an airline that could sell 300 seats and amortize the costs of the fuel and the running costs of the flight. Over 300 passengers will now have to do so over 200, and that means each of us may have to pay more. Uh, large gatherings, I've already mentioned, social behavior is going to be severely affected. Um, but there should be some positives. I think we're going to give much more emphasis to public health than we've traditionally done. India spends only 1.28% of GDP on public health, and that's really shockingly low. We need to build our capacities in public health infrastructure, and particularly after COVID and with the risk of more zoonotic viruses coming out of Chinese wet markets and God knows where else, we need to focus on epidemiology, vaccine research, intensive care units, equipping healthcare personnel. Even now, I got a complaint from nurses at AIMS that they do not have enough um, enough uh, uh, PPE, personal protective equipment 
and they're, they're, they're running from pillar to post asking for simple things like masks and gloves and guns, testing capacity, increasing more and more labs, um, uh, building well-equipped hospitals. Um, and of course, the labs around the country, we now have 112, we're probably going to need 200 uh, if this kind of virus is going to be a recurring phenomenon. Continued uh, international cooperation already mentioned the challenges we're facing is going to be a real problem. Now let's look at the impact in specific regions. One of the striking areas uh, that's been impacted is the European Union. Um, the UK left the European Union in the celebrated or condemned Brexit. But though the European Union may have survived Brexit, there is absolutely no doubt that um, that um, the the um, the epicenter of the pandemic has been in the European continent. With Italy, France, Spain, all being the worst hit countries, they've endured the refugee crisis. They've endured the uh, financial meltdown of 2008, uh, and even Brexit itself. But this has really hit them a body blow. Uh, they're all expected to face recession, not just the EU, but the UK as well, the Eurozone as a whole as well, face recession this year. And what's particularly striking is the tensions that have arisen between their countries as countries within the European Union, instead of showing solidarity, have put their own needs first and the trust among governments has diminished. In fact, nine pandemic hit governments in the Eurozone led by Italy, Spain, and France, proposed joint bond issuance, which would combine securities from different European countries. The idea was a debt would be mutualized and not set on any country's balance sheet. And the funding cost would then be lower than it would be for most highly indebted governments. The intention being to present the spread the proceeds amongst the Eurozone members according to their actual needs. These were called Corona bonds. And, um, they were meant, of course, to be an instrument of unity uh, at a time of continental crisis. What happened? Uh, did the corona bonds take off when these nine uh, pandemic hit governments, uh, led by Italy, Spain, and France, as I said, actually proposed these corona bonds? No. Germany, the Netherlands, Austria, and Finland, uh, dubbed as the frugal floor, four by the media, the frugal four. Uh, the, the Kanjus Raja, in other words, they shot them down. And they said this is um, a, a massive structural retooling and, and we're not going to um, uh, pay for you countries because you're not adequately prepared for troubled times. In fact, the uh, Dutch Prime Minister, Mark Rutte, said it would mean that you cross the line of the Rubicon into a Euro, into a Eurozone, which is more of a transfer union that was envisaged, then was envisaged by its creators. He said, I can't foresee any circumstances in which we, that is the Netherlands, would change that position. And the Spanish reacted, the Spanish um, and the Netherlands have a long historical connection. The Spanish reacted, the foreign minister, Arantxa Gonzalez, had tweeted, you see, Twitter can be a good source of geopolitics, tweeted that the EU's member states are all in the same boat together. We've hit an unexpected iceberg, and now is not the time for discussions about who gets first class and second class tickets. Now, this uh, kind of dispute is actually an illustration of the philosophical divides over the future of the European project. Uh, French President Emmanuel Macron is one of the loudest voices in Europe uh, for a united Europe. He has said, I'm trying to build European institutions that would have broader powers to handle crises like the pandemic. The corona bonds would have given the Eurozone greater political reach, you see, and they'd have provided European countries with greater protection against President Trump's willingness to abuse the dominant U.S. dollar for his own purposes. And, of course, it would have proved that European solidarity exists. So Macron was very frustrated with the opposition of the frugal four. He said, what worries me is the illness of every man for himself. I do not want this selfish and divided Europe, he said. Well, Europe is selfish and divided, and the European Commission has not been able to provide the leadership needed. The political fault lines I've described between the richer countries, the frugal four, and the poorer countries, or the less budgetarily restrained countries, if you want to put it that way, that is going to uh, 
persist within the European Union and economic setbacks could actually give a new emphasis to ideologies of nationalism and even far-right populism as governments start pandering to the prejudices and concerns of their own voters in the midst of this, um, of this European setback. Um, so um, I think we've already covered the last bit of the slide on Corona bonds. We'll move on from the, the European Union with the final thought that the solidarity of the European Union is going to be tested by all of this, and it'll, a lot will depend on how nations come together in these difficult times to work towards recovery. Now, that's just Europe, but what about the world as a whole? Uh, we may not have reached the end of history, as the historian Francis Fukuyama so rashly predicted in the beginning of the 90s when the Cold War ended. But in many ways, globalization and connectedness from about 1980 to almost 2010, 30 years globalization, that brought us close to the end of geography. Um, distance didn't seem to matter. Boundaries didn't seem to matter. Even borders didn't seem to matter when it came to transferring money, businesses, supply lines, production, all of that. Now, already in the last few years, we've been witnessing what people have been beginning to think of as a first few steps towards deglobalization. Will COVID-19 clinch that and really prompt the world to move away from globalization? I think there's some very, very worrying signs in the aftermath of the onset of COVID, and COVID is still with us. It isn't over yet. Things can get worse. The global integration of trade and finance, obviously, will suffer because, you know, a lot of trade has been disrupted. Borders have been closed. Goods aren't moving in the same old way. Finance is being pulled back. And global trade, according to the World Trade Organization, is likely to dip as much as 32%. As I mentioned in yesterday's talk, global capital flows are already back to the levels of 1980. The crisis may therefore compel countries to depart from the existing specialization they have in production, um, wary of their supply chain disruptions. Um, they may try to achieve self-sufficiency in all sectors by just saying, why do we need to depend on China for something we should be able to make for ourselves at home? America said that openly. I mentioned uh, in two earlier lectures how Japan is giving an incentive to countries to actually, uh, to its companies to come back from China to Japan, uh, and even giving a less significant incentive to countries, to Japanese companies who might be willing to pull out of China but go to other countries. Uh, they may try to achieve self-sufficiency in all sectors. India is talking about self-sufficiency. I read a media report that a committee of secretaries headed by the CEO of the Niti Aayog is discussing how do we try and enhance greater self-sufficiency in production in India. Factory closures anyway in many, many countries, perhaps most countries, uh, and production suspensions are severely disrupting global supply chains anyway. And, um, and what happens, of course, is that if every country's economy shrinks, which is what is expected and predicted, then obviously they have less money to spend, their share of global trade goes down, there's less production being sold, less production being bought, and you see inevitably a negative impact and a recession. with a reduction in investment, whether public or private. Now, public investment is there from the economic stimulus packages of governments. Private investment, much, much less available, much easier, much more difficult for many companies to do. And this could well make economies much less competitive um, uh, and, and, and hamper their export drives. Now, there's a sentence in the slide that says developing countries like India will suffer more. That seems axiomatic. It need not necessarily be the case if we get some things right. Right now, for example, the rupee is sliding, which makes our exports cheaper. So yesterday we hit an all-time low, well below 76 rupees to the dollar. So that means that goods that cost X number of dollars uh, to an American importer will cost X minus a certain percentage, and therefore the American importer might be willing to buy more goods from India. This kind of thing could also work in our favor. But there will be challenges because obviously we don't have the same degree of resilience and the same degree of economic strength and depth that a richer country would have. Um, would it be right to conclude then that um, 
the world will actually shift towards deglobalization? I think it's too early to answer that question with a definitive yes, but I have no doubt that the trends we saw before COVID of increasing nationalism, increasing protectionism, will be accelerated by a new emphasis on self-sufficiency and the lessons learned from the disruption of supply chains, which many countries have said, why should we go through this again? Every time there's a supply chain chain disruption, we suffer only because we're dependent on other countries. Let's do everything or as much as possible at home or closer to home. That's a very, very important concern. Oil wars are, of course, uh, breaking out. The oil prices have crashed to uh, absurdly low levels. You wouldn't know that by going to a petrol pump in India because we are paying heavy taxes uh, on, on every litre of petrol or diesel we buy at the pump. The global oil prices are at record lows in the last 10 years. They have suffered their biggest downfall, in fact, since the 1991 Gulf War. So in the last 29 years, not 10, uh, prices fell 31% when the Saudis uh, essentially started a price war with Russia. What happened with Russia said, let's not cut output costs. We need, the, we need the money from selling oil. So Saudi Arabia said, well, we have plenty of oil to sell, but, um, but um, if we're going to sell uh, oil at a price that the countries are able to pay and still produce so much of oil, prices will drop. And that's exactly what's happened. Um, there was a recommendation for a production cut to stabilize oil markets. If demand is less and supply is high, prices drop. That's basic economics. So if demand is low and supply also comes down closer to demand, you can stabilize prices. That was the logic. Um, but um, the Russians weren't keen on it. The Saudis have gone the other way. Now the Saudis have cut their prices. Other oil producers are also looking to protect their share of the market. So for argument's sake, if Russian oil is more expensive than Saudi oil, who'll buy Russian oil, right? And so there's going to be a price war amongst various producers. And this could benefit India because 83% of our oil requirements are imported. We don't actually produce much oil. Assam, Bombay, that's about it. And therefore, we actually need uh, lower oil prices most of the time. This is actually good news. Each fall, $1 reduction in the price of crude, with crude oil, reduces our import bill by 3,000 crores. So you're looking at very serious amounts of money uh, being saved when oil collapses by 20, 25, $30. A discount of just 10% um, on the crude oil price would save us $2 billion. And that's literally the kind of numbers we're talking about, too, which could help our government uh, both reduce its, its fiscal deficit and have no, more money available uh, to spend on the essential relief and stimulus activities required by COVID. A reduction in the import bill will, of course, um, also help prevent uh, the rupee collapsing further. But right now, a certain slide of the rupee is helping our exporters when they can get around to manufacturing and exporting. Because remember that... Uh, Demand is down everywhere. Demand is down in India. We are buying less oil. Demand is down in other countries, not just for oil, but for any goods we might want to sell. So we can't purely look at this as um, a benefit, but it's certainly the, the, the collapse in oil prices has to help oil import dependent countries like India. And that's why we see this as a more or less positive development. China is, of course, a big question mark. China has been the work engine for the world. Since about 1978, when Deng Xiaoping opened up the economy, set up these special economic zones in the coastal areas of China, eliminated uh, all uh, regulatory and other restrictions, and basically said, you do what you like, pay your workers what you want, just manufacture, manufacture, and export to the world. China became such a world leader that one third of all the manufacturing done in the world the entire manufacturing output of the world, one third comes out of China. That's unbelievable. And that's not going to last now because countries are deliberately trying to reduce their dependence on China. You know that uh, up to 2011, uh, the U.S. was number one. Now the U.S. is a distant number two. Um, and, and China did uh, not only expand its uh, manufacturing to record levels, as I say, 33% of global manufacturing, but also it, it was able to pull literally hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, raise their standards of living, double their country's uh, per capita GDP in the course of the last 10 years. 
are all of that. But now people are saying, hey, China, you had it good, but you haven't actually done us very much good in the course of the last four months. The um, disruption of the global supply chain, because China was manufacturing so many things, even when they weren't manufacturing the full item, they were manufacturing key components for it, which might have been assembled elsewhere, let's say in Malaysia or whatever. And suddenly, um, because the key parts couldn't come, Malaysia couldn't assemble, countries said, hey, how can we do this? And the American consumer couldn't buy. So they said, how can we do this? There's a fall um, uh, in Chinese exports inevitably because of the initial Chinese shutdown, but also because of COVID affecting other countries and economies. And the result of that is that um, goods generally aren't being bought. And people are saying, why should we rely uh, on, on Chinese goods anyway? Let's see what we can make do with here. Um, foreign companies have invested a lot in China. You know, some things that are made in China are actually made by America in China or made by Britain or Germany in China. Today, they may stop making those things in China, take their patents, take their product designs, maybe even take um, some of their... Uh, uh, and make them elsewhere. So inward investment to China is likely to go down. And there is terrible mistrust of China. I want to spend one minute on that because it's something that people have to appreciate. My son is a columnist of the Washington Post. He has an entire piece in, in one of his columns saying that, um, that uh, Trump is not the only person angry with China. And you go through the list of countries that have expressed serious concern about whether China actually knew more about the origins of the virus than they told the world, whether they deliberately concealed the news of deaths uh, for a couple of weeks after they knew about it, whether they misled the WHO and kept pushing the WHO to peddle a line that wasn't true, whether they encouraged continuing travel, travel not only to China but even to Wuhan in order to convey normalcy when in fact travelers were then picking up the virus and coming out with it, and whether as a result of all of this, they actually did both themselves and the world a terrible disfavor. These are questions being asked in every country, including India. And if you look at the kinds of op-eds and articles in media in every language around the world, you're going to find a very significant level of suspicion of, criticism of, and future mistrust of China. They're saying the Chinese have shown us through COVID that we can't trust them. And when you have that level of mistrust, then predictability goes, reliability goes, then China is no longer as attractive an investment and manufacturing destination as it used to be. And that is something which you folks will need to bear in mind and could be, of course, an opportunity for India. In the last few minutes before we wrap up this talk, I want to take you through a number of key issues uh, that we should really look at as we study the post-COVID world. Uh, it is important to stress that there are still a number of what we may call not just unknowns, but unknown unknowns. That is, unknown, we don't even know what are the things we don't know. It's a, it's a formulation of, uh, of Donald Rumsfeld. There are too many unknown unknowns yet about the COVID virus, how long it will take, when a vaccine will be found, whether once infected, it can be infected again, what the final death toll will be. So because of that, everything I say is tentative. Uh, one obvious issue is unpredictable economic changes. There's no question that, um, that the, the era of cheap goods could well be over because China was the one making the bulk of them and China won't be. Um, the protectionist predilections of most global leaders mean that multinational corporations will come under pressure to locate their bases closer to home. I've already mentioned Japan. The U.S. is going to do the same. Others may do the same. And without the Chinese giving you cheap labor, cheap inputs, cheap raw materials, cheap manufacturing, costs will go up everywhere else. So if you're going to buy something made in America that used to be made in China, you're going to be paying uh, you know, 50% more, perhaps, for that same item. Consumers will need to brace for higher prices. And what that means at a time when unemployment is growing is anyone's imagination. Now, this is something which we really have to be conscious of because these unpredictable uh, economic changes that we've already talked about at length during this talk are only part of the picture. There's a geopolitical reaction. One concern that many of us have is that there will be greater isolationism and protectionism. What do I mean by that? 
<laughs> the fact is that these were already trends happening or starting to happen before COVID. The support for strong men, by the way, many of these strong leaders have used the present crisis to shore up their authority and the power invested in them. Uh, India is no exception in this regard. The power of the strong men may increase exponentially. And along with it would come in an increased fear of the other, the other countries, other communities, the kind of um, uh, uh, scapegoating of Muslims we have seen in some parts of India as carriers of the virus um, are also replicated in other countries where, for example, there have been incidents of anti-Chinese racism as people have accused the Chinese of being carriers of the virus. Um, a WhatsApp video went around yesterday showing a Chinese couple being harassed in an Australian supermarket. There have been racist incidents reported elsewhere in Europe and America against people who are or who look Chinese. Um, people even using terms like the Chinese virus, looking down upon or distancing themselves from individuals with uh, those kinds of features. We've seen in India, our brothers and sisters in the Northeast being discriminated against uh, for the fear that they might be Chinese and might be carrying the virus. People being prevented access to shops, parks, subways. I mean, these kinds of things, which are a reflection of people looking for accountability for the transmission of the virus, actually throws up barricades between people, divides people, sows hatred between communities, and can be very, very bad. And at the global level, it can result in much more isolationism, much more than country. We don't need these foreigners. We don't need people who are not like us. Let's get them out of the way. And this sort of attitude um, is, is extremely, extremely dismaying. Um, and frankly, will then be followed by an undermining of multilateralism as well. When countries are more nationalist and more isolationist, they ask themselves, why do we need international or multilateral institutions? The WHO is a very good case in point. Um, the UN is another case in point. Uh, many countries, and the US is the most notorious, visible, and audible example, have said these institutions have failed. Why do we need them? They couldn't protect us. And um, the accusation against the WHO for trying to cover up the scale of the crisis in China has led the president of the US to suspend funding, as I already mentioned earlier in this talk. So multilateralism itself could be in peril. Imagine if Trump decides not to fund the United Nations activities around the world itself. These are big questions that need to worry all of us convinced internationalists. Then the next issue is the possible rise of the surveillance state. What do I mean by that? During the current outbreak, you know, a key issue that was often debated early on were the inadequacies of existing data systems to monitor the spread of the virus transmission. So then you have the urgent development of dedicated apps and tools to track people's data, their travel history, their contact with other individuals, the Arugya Setu app in India, which uses GPS, cell phone towers, and so on, Bluetooth, in order to find out whether you've gone near anybody who's carrying. Now, all this is at the moment for a benign purpose, trace the virus. But the post-COVID world could see an enhanced deployment of the same kinds of tools of surveillance and data, data gathering even under the guise of preventing a similar scenario in the future. And this is worrying. I mean, in India, it's already been studied by international groups that the Arogya Setu app does not have the protections built into similar apps in, say, Singapore, uh, which have um, eliminated some of the risks inherent in the Arogya Setu app. How exactly is this process of deployment going to be implemented? Uh, what will happen to the individual's right to privacy, which has been upheld in India by the Supreme Court? Uh, will further actions by the government um, ensure greater surveillance and data generation uh, for the regulatory authorities? And what does that do to freedom, democracy, and liberty within our own country? Um, I'll try and rush through the last few points because we have reached the end of our time for this. Um, changes to urban planning. Um, COVID-19 is prompting many ways of rethinking of, of urban planning, uh, where you've got urban centers with high population density within a small radius. How can you have social distancing like that? Not possible. Uh, if your proximity to a job is no longer a significant factor because of telecommuting, internet connections, and so on, in deciding where you live, then, of course, the appeal of densely packed urban areas will wane. And... Uh, 
essentially you can work out of a village as long as you've got good broadband connectivity. With 5G likely to come on stream in the course of the next year or two, you're likely to see very major changes, not just in the way people work, particularly in the developed world, through um, video conference, telecommuting, and so on, but even the way people live and the kind of planning that will take place. We'll see major improvements. That's less uh, going to happen in India right now, but India will not be far behind. We've been leapfrogging many of these technological developments uh, in the telecoms business, particularly. We're likely to get there too. Improvements to social security infrastructure are likely to happen. Public health, we already talked about. Now India has completely woken up to migrant workers. I hope we'll never ever deal with another virus. Had enough planning to give the migrant workers time to get home instead of announcing it at four hours notice and shutting down all the trains and buses, which is what created the crisis for the migrant workers. We should be conscious of that. We should be aware of economic recovery planning uh, that will take time. We need a task force, I think, uh, to focus on post COVID revival, not just the bureaucrats and government officials, but as I mentioned yesterday, representing diverse sectors of our economy businesses, small shopkeepers, and we should decide quickly how we can change the regulatory system in our country so ease of doing business really becomes real. Uh, I'm going to try and, and end there, uh, adding, of course, that we will also have to worry about uh, biological warfare because there's some rumors still that the virus came from a biological weapons lab, or at least it was a lab from which the virus might have escaped. Uh, economic warfare could take place. The people have seen how disrupting supply chains can bring an economy to its knees. Cyber warfare as enhanced data tools and, and cyber tools come up. Uh, we'll have to protect our borders, of course, always. But uh, when we've spent have 600 times more on our borders than we have spent on public health, uh, what are we doing? Um, is, is defense only now military defense? Or do we need defense to protect our ways of life? our natural environment, the health of our people, and the clean air we breathe, which is something I've written about in an op-ed in the Indian Express today that I hope you'll read. We need to defend the clean air gains we've made as a result of this virus and the lockdown. But I think we're clearly set for a sort of global samudra mountain, a churning of the seas, and everything I've said to you today may look woefully out of date by this time next year, when either the virus would have played its course vaccine will have been found and we treat COVID as nothing more than another kind of flu, or the world will be unrecognizable because the suffering has been unimaginably prolonged. Who knows what's going to happen? Let's turn to your questions. First question is from Shruti Apale. Can we say that the Gandhian ideology is relevant even today in the context of international relations? Gandhiji would certainly say so because his view is very much summarized in the phrase, small is beautiful. He didn't want big industries. He didn't want even national uh, trade and commerce. He was looking at self-sufficient village republics. Each village was going to be self-sufficient. So the last thing he cared about at that point was creating gigantic national industries, or uh, and he had not even thought about gigantic multinational industries. So for him, the solution of going back to the ideals he described in Hind Swaraj of little villages that are doing their own thing, uh, producing whatever they need and, and serving themselves, that's how the world should live. I think, frankly, that idea was out of was, was past this time, even when he wrote it. Um, as a moral principle, yes, it makes sense. Doing things on a small scale, encouraging small scale, encouraging cottage industries, yes, but you can't do away without national and international trade, in my view. So Gandhiji um, had, had a very clear vision, and he would feel vindicated about what's happening right now, but I don't think you can put that genie back into the bottle. I think we need to continue to sustain a global economy. The next question, Shruti, uh, the next question is from Shrishti. How can India effectively tackle the after effects of the global lockdown, especially its impact on poor and vulnerable communities? Uh, the fact is, there's so many people giving so many suggestions. I'm just adding one more voice to it, but I already have mentioned the task force idea. I think we really need that. Uh, abolish some regulations. I think we need immediate resumption of agricultural activity. Uh, harvest in Punjab and, and Haryana are beginning to happen, or, or literally things will rot in the fields. You can't delay the rabi harvest much longer. Uh, we need to restart certain micro, medium, and small enterprises very quickly. Micro in particular, these are the enterprises with two to seven employees. Little lathe operator, he was already badly hit by demonetization 
because the business would come in in the morning, <clears throat> he would do the work during the day, he'd be paid in the evening, and he'd pay his workers out of that. <clears throat> when demonetization came, liquidity disappeared, no one had cash, these businesses collapsed. Uh, lacks of, 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 of micro and medium enterprises have, have, have failed, have, have small, have fallen, have failed. We need to ensure that they're given a chance to revive. Uh, otherwise, the impact on jobs and, and income disruption will be unbearable for us. We need, of course, to resume our basic economic activities like uh, store supply lines, particularly across states, uh, store retail services, because we can't afford the crisis of essential goods to completely paralyze our economy and our social lives at a time when social distancing remains in place. And then, of course, resumption of other activities will have to follow construction. The, the, the shops and restaurants have to be open. Industries uh, must begin to operate, um, maybe with special safety protocols. The government has already given some indications of these. Um, I must say, if the challenge of shutting down India was huge, the challenge of reopening India is going to be even huger, bigger, more serious. We can't afford to remain shut down indefinitely because, as we all know, lives matter but so do livelihoods. And the poor and the vulnerable, as Shishti rightly points out, need our priority attention. Sitan Chowagarwal says, despite commendable efforts by the government to evacuate Indians from other countries post the COVID-19 outbreak, many are still stranded outside India. What's the role of the Indian diplomatic institutions in handling this crisis? Let me say, Shitanshu, they've been doing a terrific job. And I, even though I'm an opposition MP, I've been in daily touch with the foreign minister, with many of our embassies around the world, because I have so many constituents as a Trivandrum MP from Kerala who are stuck. I've had requests from 17 different countries. I have fishermen stuck in Iran who today were thrown out of their accommodations. I have students stuck in a dozen different countries desperate to come back. I've got travelers who've gone on business trips and the flights were cancelled before they could return. All of these cases, but the government obviously has to take a collective decision. The foreign ministry alone cannot do so. And the home ministry and others have decreed there will be no evacuations from India for fear of straining our health capacities. We don't know yet how many cases are going to come up in India in the next couple of weeks or until the 3rd of May. So the government's attitude is at a time when we may have more than enough cases to handle through our hospital system, we can't bring potentially new cases in from abroad. And so their policy has been very strict, no flights of evacuation back to India. But then what about people being stuck in foreign countries that don't want them? Many countries have said, you, you know, your visas are not renewed, you have to go, you have to leave. Well, our diplomacy, our foreign minister personally and many of his ambassadors have been negotiating with foreign countries to say, please let them remain. Often there are no dramatic public announcements in order not to set any precedents because we are getting a special deal for our nationals that other countries may not be getting. That's very important. Second, some of our nationals are stuck in poor countries where there isn't enough healthcare infrastructure, there's less than in India, and there's not enough doctors and nurses. Yet our government is faced with an invidious choice. If we send Indian doctors and nurses to treat Indians stuck in those countries, the political uh, climate will turn hostile. People say, how can you send Indian doctors abroad when Indians are dying in India? And so it's a very, very difficult, thankless task for the Indian government. I must say, I want to pay tribute to my friend, Dr. Jayashankar, the foreign minister, uh, and many of our hardworking, diligent, committed um, ambassadors and diplomatic personnel around the world. They've been involved in evacuating people when evacuations were possible. They've been involved in helping people where evacuations are not possible. And they're continuing to stay on top of this. They're not taking it easy during the lockdown. I can assure you, Shitan Shogarwal. Um, Anup Pulapalli says, President Donald Trump has an aggressive, hostile, and unconventional way of handling international relations. You can say that again, Anup. Does this political approach appeal to nationalists? What are the chances that other countries will resort to similar tactics? Fortunately, the chances are not that great. Because one of the reasons President Trump can get away with it is not just because he's a, a muscle-flexing nationalist who famously said America first and make America great again and didn't care a fig about the rest of the world. It's also because America is still the world's largest economy. It is de facto the world's only superpower. It is still a country that displaces a much larger weight 
than 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 almost any other country. Uh, then almost all the other countries combined, if you take China out of the equation, China has obviously become a very significant player, but everywhere, everyone else knows that the U.S. is vastly more powerful, influential, and so on than them. So if the president of the U.S. behaves badly, everyone lumps it, they take it in stride. If a president of a smaller country is rude, people will just give him a kick in the pants, and so it's not the same, not the same thing. But what I do worry about is if this kind of approach carries on, if ending funding to WHO is followed by ending funding to the UN, is followed by the US pulling out of more international bodies the way they pulled out of UNESCO already, and suddenly you find a US retrenching and saying, we don't need the world, now the world can pack up and go home, then other countries will feel emboldened to follow the same example. And the hard-fought gains of the second half of the 20th century will sadly be lost. This is why, in my book, co-authored with Samir Saran of the ORF, I've talked about the New World Disorder and recommended a reboot to global governance, creating a new pattern of global governance in which countries like India that believe in international cooperation would step up to the plate and play a very serious and constructive role. Um, and finally, this is the last question. Tinari uh, asks, since India is vigorously lobbying against China's Belt and Road Initiative, because of our sovereignty concerns, is India close to finding an alternative to this initiative? Look, India's concerns are not only sovereignty. Sovereignty is one important concern because China's flagship project in the BRI is a road through Pakistan-occupied Kashmir, which even China at the UN recognizes as disputed territory and not as Pakistani territory, and yet they did it without consulting India, the other party to the dispute. So. China has certainly uh, violated, in principle, our sovereignty. In practice, that territory is controlled by Pakistan, so they could do it. But because of that, India has said, as a matter of principle and sovereignty, we will boycott BRI, we have refused to attend the BRI conference, and so on. Uh, but at the same time, it's not only sovereignty. We have very real concerns about the pattern in which BRI projects are being undertaken. We've seen this in Sri Lanka, where the Chinese give so much money to our country and there is interest to be paid. It may not be a very high rate of interest, but the amounts are so large that they completely stretch a country's capacity to repay. And Sri Lanka found that debt servicing on Chinese loans for the development of Hambantota port was so great that it was actually easier for them to just give the port to the Chinese for 99 years in lieu of paying them the interest on the debt. So China is essentially now running a crucial port in Sri Lanka, our neighboring country, by means of having given or saddled a country, a neighbor of ours, with a level of debt it couldn't afford to repay. And we warned countries that this could be very dangerous for them. So we also have a substantive concern. It's not only the sovereignty concern, which is one of legal principle, but a substantive concern about unviable debt. Uh, do we have an alternative? We've offered a few things. We've talked about um, uh, uh, various uh, projects in particularly sub-regional ones that help countries. But let's be honest, all the things we're offering, and we have, we have come up with a few creative ideas, have not fully made the impact that the Chinese have because we don't have the resources the Chinese have. The Chinese have the world's largest trade surplus, the world's largest investable surplus hard currency, and they're able to throw money at countries in ways that we can't and that most other countries can't. So, all we can do is go to neighboring countries and say, we'll do bilateral projects for you. We're very effective on that in, in, in Bhutan. Alternatively, we can go to sub-regional groupings, the BBIN, which was um, a combination of Bhutan, Bangladesh, India, and Nepal, uh, was considered one possible way of developing a strong kind of capacity in our backyard. We don't have the kind of money that enable us to have a reach halfway across the globe the way the Chinese do. Uh, there's BIMSTEC, there's a SARC. I think in those areas, and of course in our bilateral relations with Africa, we might be able to offer modest alternatives, but let's not think we can compete with China. We should compete with China. There's enough in the world for all of us, and let the Chinese play their own games. Right now, they're paying a very, pretty heavy price for their mistakes of the last four months. That is it. Thank you all very, very much. We've hit the magic five o'clock mark. It was delightful to see you all. I look forward to tomorrow's final lecture. And this time, it hasn't been a very pleasant subject, but it at least gives us directions on which to think about the lockdown and its impact, even as we watch it unfold in real time 
in the months ahead. Thank you all very much. Stay home, stay safe. Jai Hind.